In New Zealand, about 47% of our gross emissions are from agriculture in the form of methane and nitrous oxide. That simply reflects that that's what we do as an economic basis in, in this country. We do it very well and most of it is being exported as a product. New Zealand does face pressure to control our emissions internationally. We're going to face some sort of target. It was Kyoto, but it'll be something different going forward. And we want to do that in the most efficient way that we can. The government has indicated that they want to reduce emissions by about 50% by the year 2050. Um, if half of our emissions are from agriculture, then clearly agriculture has to be part of that. I'm Mike Barton. With my wife Sharon, we farm here on the northwestern side of Lake Taupo. We have 142 hectares. We've been here since 2004. I'm a corporate refugee. Decided to come here and go farming and spend more time fishing and hunting. The reality is that the environmental legislation and issues surrounding emissions capping from farming has somewhat taken over my life, so I don't do quite the trout fishing that I thought I might. About 30% roughly of all agricultural emissions is in the form of nitrous oxide. That comes from both nitrogen containing fertilizer applications but also simply the fact that animals in New Zealand graze on paddocks, they pee on the paddock, and that contains a lot of nitrogen that's in parts broken down into nitrous oxide. Methane in agriculture in New Zealand comes almost exclusively from ruminant livestock, and that's simply the methane that's generated by microbes in the gut of the animals, which are part of the digestive process. Some people argue that methane shouldn't really be taken seriously because it's comparatively short-lived in the atmosphere. But that's, I think, both short-sighted and simply incorrect. Methane is currently the second most important greenhouse gas responsible for warming of the atmosphere. I'm Megan Owen. I live on a dairy farm outside of Hamilton with my husband, Jason Ham. We have two children, Olivia and Olivia. Ethan. We share milk here on 186 hectares. My husband and I have been share milking for 15 years now. For the first eight years of that I was working off farm in a semi-corporate environment and when we had children I came home to be a full-time mum. So my duties on the farm are pretty much administration, looking after some of the herd records, making sure we pay the tax and pay the staff, recruit the staff and keep some of our processes tight. We farm under a nitrogen cap and every farm in the catchment uh, operates under those conditions as part of the legislation that protects the lake. Without sounding arrogant, I think most of what I can do to reduce my emissions profile, I've done. All our streams are fenced off. I'm very conscious about how I fertilise. We're conscious about the class of animal that we farm and how we farm it and we grow them as fast as possible. The reality is there's not a lot else I can do to reduce my emissions profile other than destocking. We know a lot about farm management practices. We know that targeting your fertilizer application can reduce nitrous oxide emissions. We know that not sending stock onto very damp paddocks would reduce nitrous oxide emissions, but it's all in the management space. What we're lacking is technological interventions. We are not in a position right now to say, oh, just you know, use that pill and it'll reduce methane. Hey Malcolm. Our farm has been the site of, of a range of, of experiments both by ag research and by land care research to look at ways of mitigating the impact of our farming operation on the environment, but particularly in relation to water quality. When it comes to mitigation we're looking at two gases. Methane, which comes out of the mouth of ruminants, nitrous oxide, which really comes from nitrogen waste on soils in, in New Zealand. We've got four basic approaches in methane. We're looking at vaccines, we're looking at chemical inhibitors, they both attack the bugs in the rumen. We're looking at feeding situations, can we change the feed so we get less methane? And finally, we're looking at animal breeding, that lovely goal of breeding low emitting animals. For nitrous oxide, we're looking at attacking something called the nitrification pathways through a group of products called nitrification inhibitors. 
And a second approach is to look at something called the denitrification pathway, whereby we can uh, alter the ratio of nitrogen gas to nitrous oxide. So it's obviously one thing to have a great scientific idea how you could reduce emissions. It's another thing to create a product that can actually be used and will be used by farmers on the ground because after all it's thousands of very small scale farms that cause the agricultural emissions in New Zealand. For some of the mitigation strategies that have been mooted, farmers don't have the skill base and they don't have the confidence in themselves or the system to make it happen. And I think that's one of the key things is that farmers, when they know that it'll work and they see their neighbour making it work and they get the confidence to do it themselves, they'll do it. But if there's a lot of cost involved, they won't. We personally don't use nitrogen inhibitors on the farm because the cost of applying them and getting the equipment is 100% on us. It doesn't make sense for us to do that. This question of technology adoption by farmers is an interesting one because I think as an industry we would very much pride ourselves in being one of the most agile and responsive industries in the world. I think from a farmer's perspective what's really crucial about mitigation is that it's stuff that's going to work on farm, it's farm ready. I don't buy into the argument that farmers won't take up technology. What they won't do is take up technology that has an adverse effect on their bottom line or where the regulatory regimes that surround that technology are still uncertain. You have to remember farming is a really long-term business. So if I'm going to bring about change on my farm that will reduce my environmental impact, I need to know that the regulations coming from government or from regional authorities are also operating in the same time frame as me. We're foolish if, as a nation, we are just going to say, I'm oh, science will solve all these problems. We're talking about organic biological systems that have their limits. And I think we have to accept that. Sometimes people get really hung up on the technology. They sort of say there aren't technologies available now. We should wait because there are these new technologies coming through. It'd be great if they come through and they're marvellous. But there's actually really a lot we can do right now. Even in New Zealand, although we can talk about on average our efficiency is extremely good, there will be considerable variation. Now, that variation gives you scope for improvement. New Zealand has lots of farmers who are aware of climate change and aware of water quality issues and are doing some amazing stuff right now. If we could get all farmers in New Zealand just doing the good practice that's already happening in a lot of places, it would make a massive difference. One of the key things is to be able to give farmers something that they can measure their impact and it becomes something real then. So all of a sudden we're keeping score. People like success and farmers will try and emulate success. So if you can show them this is what success looks like and this is how you get there, then that's a really powerful way of making sure that those farmers go out and can convert the masses, a ripple effect. You will always have a tail end of people that don't want to change. And it's just making sure that that tail's as small as possible and that if average becomes good, we will have such a huge impact. People talk about the ETS or greenhouse gases. Pastoral farmers get get quite get quite um, yeah quite defensive. I think there's been a lot of fear and misinformation. Speaking as somebody who's involved in the rural community, most farmers are confused. I think there is a spectrum of views out there in the farming community about the ETS. At the current time, any charges on New Zealand emissions is just going to be a tax. It's just going to be additional cost, which is worn straight into the bottom line. If somebody comes to any business in New Zealand and says, hey, we're going to tax you an extra 30 grand a year, the farmer will do what every business person will do. They will either try and cut costs, which is pretty hard for them to do at the moment, or increase revenue. And the only way they know how to increase revenue is increase production. Farmers will just dial up the palm kernel truck or their intensive farm, put more stock on, which is not what you want. I mean, I'm an economist, so I love incentives, but not even I am stupid enough to believe that if you set a price and let things rip, that that's actually going to solve all the world's problems. This is a really complicated 
biological issue. For any policy to be effective, it has to seem fair to people. And particularly when you're dealing with 40,000 farmers, you can't have them all opposed to you and make a policy work. And you're going to have a better policy if they've been involved because they'll be able to point out the problems and they'll be able to identify opportunities that people in Wellington are not going to have thought of. If you want something to change behaviour, you need somebody to actually who understands the business to make sure that what you're implementing is going to change behaviour. Um, because you might actually be making a situation worse. The costs of reducing your emissions profile are significant. Within that context, it's very difficult to get people to change behaviour voluntarily. So you're going to require legislation in order to bring about that change. But we have to be very careful as to how we implement that legislation because the farming business model is, is stressed or, or is under tension now. A confrontational type approach where farmers feel that the government's coming to get them or you know, people are, are attacking us um, is, is never going to be helpful. If you step back from that debate and look at global climate change and the challenge and in some cases the opportunities that are there, there's actually a lot more space for collaboration between industry, government, scientists, consumers, environmental groups and so forth. What we're really trying to achieve here is a complete change in the way we run society. And I don't mean that in a scary way, but that there is a role for changes in, in every aspect of our lives. And that's not something that government's going to tell us how to do. We're going to work that out from below. It's about universities, it's about iwi, it's about um, sector groups, federated farmers. And it's not just national, it's regional levels and it's community and local levels. We need you know, to look for little continuous improvements that you can be made at, at, at local levels. And that requires communities, you know, sharing ideas and working together and farmers leaning over the fence and talking about, have you tried this, have you tried that? People look to their rural community for validation. So you might get a really cool idea from outside of your community, but actually you're going to pick up the phone and you're going to talk to your neighbour or your brother-in-law or someone to actually bounce the ideas around and say, well, is, is that right for me? If we see it brewing from below and a kind of peer-to-peer -peer growth of information and sharing, then that will make it a lot more sustainable than if it's something coming down from a central policy platform. If you have the concern and the capability and then you have the incentives coming from policy, the whole package will work much better because people will actually respond to it. If we want to have conversations around environmental impact of farming, we have to engage the consumer. So we've got to take this debate outside of the sphere of the farmer and the regional authority, and we have to get the consumer involved. We started 12 months ago trialling the idea that consumers might be interested to pay a premium for meat that was produced in a way that protects the lake. We kill beef for that market. We're now selling those through the Topol Beef Programme. We asked the restaurant to charge an absolute premium for that meat and make it the most expensive item on the menu. And it was a resounding success. We couldn't keep up with demand. We've now formalised the process and we sell to a range of restaurants and a butcher in town. Thank you. I think there are enough consumers out there with disposable income who understand this issue and they are willing to pay a premium. It's worked for us. Ultimately, the people who benefit from the food are the consumers who eat it. And so we are ultimately responsible for the emissions associated with that food. In the really long term, if there's regulation in all the countries, the prices and the costs of controlling the emissions will automatically flow down to consumers. In the short to medium term, we need consumers to understand that their, their food is associated with emissions. Because of our credibility in terms of agricultural research, and because of our credibility in terms of food safety, we're perfectly placed to start a process of defining what I call the emissions profile of food. So over time, you, you're going to get the consumer driving behavioural change in farms. One of the most interesting questions here is, in 20 years' time, is the consumer in Shanghai 
going to make food purchasing decisions based on sustainability issues, because that becomes the key driver for New Zealand. The strange thing about climate change as an environmental problem to regulate is that it's global. So we have to think not only of how we mitigate within New Zealand, but how that fits into a global system. And in the global system, we're moving to a population of nine or 10 billion, and all those people are gonna to need to eat. We're not simply looking at reducing agricultural emissions. Yes, they are part of the climate change story, but they can't be divorced from food security issues. This is part of a global package, which makes it much harder to understand. But if we're good at producing food, and we can do it in a low emissions way, we should be producing more food, not less food. When we're the only developed nation in the world that relies almost entirely on agriculture for our export income. We can't afford to subsidise agriculture or subsidise the price of food for environmental gain. We have to find a solution. And I believe that the place that we occupy gives us the perfect opportunity to understand these issues more deeply and then model them for, for other jurisdictions and other countries around the world. If we are still at the forefront, then not only will we be able to sell our goods better, uh, but we'll also be able to sell our ideas to the world in terms of how to, how to solve the issues. Clearly, if New Zealand is the only country that ever does anything about agriculture, nobody is better off and New Zealand is worse off. So that's not the point of it, but the point is to demonstrate ways and points of engagement for other countries to achieve a long-term reduction in agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. All of that has a major benefit for New Zealand in the sense that it's recognised as somebody who promotes environmentally responsible farming. I think the idea of us being global leaders is relevant to farmers because they like to lead the world. For us to lead, when it comes back to that being able to quantify, you know, how good are we? If, if we want to say we're leaders, we need to be able to show that actually this is the world's best. New Zealand has a history of leading in policy initiatives and policy development. Uh, we did it in fisheries, we did it with our reserve bank, we did it with taking off agricultural subsidies. If we can create a system that really works and that is supported politically and that is robust and stable, then people will want to copy us. And that could be a really significant contribution to the global effort on mitigation. And that's something we could do within our lifetimes in a really visible way.